today, everybody, I have a special guest, someone that started playing hockey at 45, started surfing in his 60s, but worked for Apple as the chief evangelist, which I want to find out more about that. But it's also the chief evangelist of Canva, which a lot of us all use and has an amazing book and a podcast that I want to talk about. So welcome to the show, Guy. Oh, thank you very much for having me on your show. I mean, the next thing I'm going to do today is go surfing. So, you know, this is my, this is my last. Yeah. There you go. Cogent moments. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been, I've been following you for a while, um, you know, before kind of, uh, a lo- you know, I, I think we spoke at social mar- media marketing world many, many moons ago and been following you ever since. So. The, the ones in San Diego? In San Diego, yes. Yeah. Those are, do they still have those? I don't know. I, I, I haven't spoken at those in a long, long time. I, yeah. So. I, I stopped going to shows where they thought it was a privilege for you to speak at the show. So they don't pay any expenses or they don't pay any fees. <laughs> I'm on the other side of that equation now. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Well, let's talk about, I, I love what you say about there's kind of three, like we live our life in kind of thirds around, you know, not, you know, we're getting underpaid when we first start, then we get overpaid <laughs> and then we're giving back. Yeah. Talk a little bit more about what that means. Cause I think that that's really, that means a lot to me as an agency owner. And I think that would mean a lot to the people listening as well. I think that th- that's just an observation about my life that my first third of my career, I was underpaid looking back for what I accomplished, uh, in particular for Apple. And then in the second third of my life, like I have to pinch myself, like you're offering me how much to do what? And, and you know, I, I, I actually, I've used the speaker's agents because I couldn't say with a straight face what I wanted. <laughs> you know, it's like, why not? Oh, <laughs> well, I mean, I asked for a lot and like, it's hard for me, you know, coming from where I came from to think, you know, how can you possibly be worth that per hour? <laughs> and then now I'm, I'm 70 years old and, and, uh, I'm, you know, I'm, fi- I'm financially set, not in the billionaire sense, but, you know, I got enough money to live the rest of my life and, and now I, I just want to pay back. Uh, I don't want to pay back everything, so I don't have enough money to live the rest of my life. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, I, I've I've uh, I've created the heritage trust for my kids, and so now I can just run my balance down to zero. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> well, I I always told my kids I'm I'm swiping my last dollar on my way out, so you guys got to work your ass off. <laughs> yeah, I I like that. You know, did do you ever hear the famous? Um, uh, is it? I think I don't know if it's Shaquille O'Neal or LeBron James, but somebody said, you know, we are not rich. I'm, I'm rich. rich. You're not <laughs> rich. <laughs> Who was it, LeBron or Shaquille? I well, Shaquille says, from what I remember, he says you got to get three degrees to get any of my cheese. <laughs> which, which I like, um, but like you know. You want your your kids to see the lifestyle that's possible, and you want them to go past that, but you don't want to hand it to them. That that was always my biggest fear as as we were growing the agency and when we sold the agency and all of that. I was like, you know, I don't want these entitled pieces of shit. And I can honestly <laughs> say that they're amazing. And like my my oldest. He's more responsible than me. Like I'll buy something and he's like, that's a bad life decision. But, Dad. but is that saying a lot? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. True. That is true. Touche. Yes. yes. Well, you know, I listen, I, I have this theory that yeah, the, the first generation, like I'm Japanese American. So the first generation is picking sugar cane and the, the next generation is doing, you know, less pure manual labor and the third generation which is me you know we're doing all like bullshit tech stuff that's like not real 
And oh my God, what's the fourth generation going to do? The fourth generation is going to be like working virtually from Bali two hours a day and thinking, oh my God, ah, my life is so hard. I had to put in two hours today on Google meetings, right? Yeah, well, it's, scary thought. It, it's like people say, you know, hard times make tough people. Tough people mm -hmm. make great times. Great times make weak people. And <laughs> I mean, you, you could make the case that this is one of the reasons why, I don't know where you are politically, but you know, this, you could make the case that this is one of the reasons why we need to support immigration because we need people who are constantly coming in, who are hungry, who are first and second generation and not fourth generation trust fund babies trying to work two hours from Bali and Costa Rica. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, one of my neighbor's kids, they just graduated from Harvard Business School. And I was like, ooh, I was like, nothing against Harvard Business School, but they haven't been told, they've been told their whole life that they're the most, the best thing since sliced bread. Yeah. They've never had that chip on the shoulder that a lot of us have had or been told, no, you're not good enough. And then you just, you have that grit to just keep freaking plowing along. Yeah, to get yeah. to the next level. So, so you've been the chief evangelist for Apple and Canva. What does that mean? <laughs> it means a life of prosperity. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I don't think that's what you're asking. So the word evangelism comes from a Greek term that means bringing the good news. So what an evangelist does is bring the good news. I brought the good news of Macintosh that it increased people's creativity and productivity. I'm bringing the good news of Canva that makes everybody a better communicator because it enables you to create beautiful graphic designs. And so in, in a sense, evangelism is the purest form of sales because it's not just about your quota, your bonus, your salary. It's about what's good for the other person. So when you evangelize Macintosh or you evangelize Canva, yes, it's good for Guy, but it's also very good for the person using Canva and using Macintosh. Gotcha. So what a chief evangelist does is spread the good news. I love that. Let's talk about the book and think remarkable. If you had to, and I know you put down all the remarkable people that you felt in the book, but now looking at, you know, I, the book's been out a little while. Is there anyone that we all know that you would have put in the book that you didn't? Yeah. Well, you know, this, this book was done, done, done in about September or October. And I interviewed one person after that. Uh, her name is Mary Murphy. And Mary Murphy is a protege of Carol Dweck. Carol Dweck is the mother of the growth mindset. And Mary Murphy had brought this body of knowledge to me that I had never heard, which is that Carol Dweck's mindset theories, it's all about what's in your head. Like, do you believe you can learn new skills? Do you believe in taking risks? Do you believe that you can accomplish things? That's the growth mindset. And 99% of that is what's in your head. Mary Murphy introduced the concept of you also need a supportive environment. Because if you have the growth mindset, but you're in a fixed mindset company, it's just not going to work. So it's just as important to be in a growth environment as it is to have a growth mindset. And I never thought of that before. And so if I were writing the book again, uh, that would definitely be in the book. Yeah, that is true. Like when I think about it of if you hang out with 10 people and they're not in that growth mindset and I tell them and I go, and th this happened to me to a couple of my friends. I was like, Hey, I'm turning 47. I've always wanted to fly a plane. I'm going to get my pilot's license. Oh, you're too old. You're too dumb. You're not going to be able to do it. I'm like, no, I want the challenge, which it was the most humbling thing I've ever done. It was the hardest thing I've ever done is learn how to fly and not yeah. kill myself or kill other people. <laughs> but like, if, if, you, if you have that support system, it's so much easier. When I got around other pilots, they're like, hey, let me help you. This is what worked for me. Well, you know, but what I don't understand about that story is 
why would anybody who is quote unquote your friend say that? I mean, they think maybe they're protecting you from disappointment or death, but like, why would you tell somebody you cannot do? I mean, it's one thing if you said, okay, I'm 47, I'm going to play in the NBA, right? Okay, I understand that. It's like some physical issue there, but what? Why would they say you couldn't be a podcaster or you cannot fly or you cannot write a book or you can't? I mean, I don't understand that at all. Well, we're not close friends anymore with them. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want that discouragement. Uh, I was like, well, who are you to tell me what I can and can't do? Like, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Other than bad friends, kind of like I just talked about, what are the things that you felt that held you back in your career that oh. you overcame? Okay, so let's just let's just put it out there that on a scale of 1 to 10 of things holding you back in your life, bad friends, negative friends, you know, doom and gloom friends. I think they're about a 2, all right. What's really holding most people back is their own mindset. It's it's the it's the it's the pessimist, it's the naysayer in their head. It's not the friend. The friend is relatively easy to ignore, as you proved. It's when you don't believe you can do something. That's the problem. And, you know, I kind of encountered this when I wrote my first book in 1987, and I wrote The Macintosh Way. And I'm telling you, what was going through my mind is like, Guy, how can you possibly believe you can write a book? You're not an English major. You don't have a PhD in English. You've never taken Stanford continuing education series in how to write a book. You know, you don't have an author mentor. You're like, you know, what makes you think you can write a book? And then my wife gave me a book called If You Want to Write by Brenda Eulin. And this book is a life changer for me because basically it said, if you want to write, write. You don't need anybody else's permission. You don't need external, you know, validation of the the Yale school on writing a book or you know, you don't need to take a course in how to write a book. If you want to write, just freaking write. And now, you know, many people listening to this may not be a writer, but if you're in any kind of endeavor like that, just substitute the word write and take that out and put it, you know, put in surf, put in fly, put in make movies, put in podcast, put in whatever you want. That's the, the concept is the same. I think a lot of us have that imposter syndrome when we first start. Well, I mean, I, I had that when, when we started building the agency and I started building and hiring really amazing leaders, I look around the room going, why the hell am I here? Like, when are they going <laughs> to, when are they going to figure out the CEO needs to go? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, okay. I have some thoughts about that. So thought number one is it is far better to have the imposter syndrome than to have the entitlement syndrome. Because the entitlement syndrome is you look around the room and you say, these people are lucky to work for me because I am so freaking superior to all of them. They're going to learn from me. They should be paying me to work here, right? That's a much worse syndrome to overcome than imposter syndrome. Because imposter syndrome, at least it implies that you are awake as opposed to awoke. You are awake and and you are relating to you know feelings of inferiority or feelings of you know insecurity or all that and and i got to tell you man it's not so bad to feel inferior and insecure if you work to overcome that if you let it cripple you that's another thing but i mean on the other hand when you feel entitled you you just don't grow no who do which one of our leaders, and let's not get into political, uh, I, I, I was watching something and I, I know your book is all about grit, growth, and grace. And I really, I really resonate with that. I'm like, yes. Is there a leader of a major company that, can you do it? Can you grow a company without all three? Well, I can give you one shining, stunning example of someone who has become one of the richest people in the world, huge success, but absolutely gets an F in terms of grace. 
And you can guess who this is, right? So Elon Musk. It, yeah, Elon Musk. I mean, three or four <laughs> years ago, if you had said to me, who's the closest person to Steve Jobs in the world? I would have said Elon Musk. In fact, I might have made the case that Elon Musk may be more remarkable than Steve Jobs because Steve Jobs just did, you know, computers and phones and pods and pads, but Elon Musk did cars and satellites and space travel and tunnels Crazy. and chips and, you know, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Whereas Steve just did computer stuff. But as far as a you know a, a, a grade for being grace and graciousness, he gets an F, absolute failure, right? So you, I mean, do you think though that's because he's got to be on the spectrum? <laughs> uh, he's off the spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what makes him so brilliant. Like I was watching a movie the other day, which I really love, and it's called Lucy. Have you seen it? Is it a Charles Schultz or is it about the gorilla? I mean, which Lucy are we talking about? Oh, okay. So <laughs> it's the Scarlett Johansson uh, as the main actress. And her name was Lucy. And it, they actually do reference the first ape or the first human as, as Lucy. Yeah. But they put drugs in her and they popped. But she got a, the whole premise of the movie, her brain... You know, our brains work at 10%. That's all we use. And so this drug that they put in her to do this drug trafficking affected her, her mind, her, um, and it started showing her get 20% of her brain capacity and then 50 all the way up to a hundred. And as she started using more brain, she started becoming less human. She didn't care about the feelings yeah. and all of that. And when I look at like someone like at Elon Musk, I see that of going, I don't care about how this makes someone feel. I just know this is what we need to do to accomplish our mission. And that's all he can focus on. Well, okay. So this is a deep philosophical question. So, so don't get me wrong. I believe that Steve Jobs was a mission-driven asshole, right? So <laughs> now there's other kinds of assholes. The main kind of asshole is the ego-driven asshole, which is it's all about me. It's all my glory. You know, the world exists for me. The the world revolves around me. I don't think Steve Jobs was that kind of asshole. Steve Jobs was all about making the best computer possible. And if you stood in his way, he would run you over. That's the kind of asshole he was. Now I, I can't tell you that I'm trying to tell you that I'm endorsing being an asshole because there are other ways to accomplish your goals. And Melanie Perkins of Canva has proven that. But I, I think the deep philosophical question, which I have been thinking about for decades and I have not yet answered, is that which comes first? So you're an asshole, so you become successful. Or... You're successful, so people tolerate your assholeness. Which one came first? I am not sure to this day. <laughs> well, with Steve, you mentioned Elon Musk doesn't have the grace. Did Steve have grace? Well, I, it would be difficult to say that Steve was a gracious person. <laughs> okay, don't, don't get me wrong, but I, I certainly, I certainly think that. Steve had much more respect for social conventions and stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. He was, you know, he was no Jane Goodall. He was no saint or angel, but he certainly, you know, he didn't do shit like what Elon does. I mean, he, and there's no way. I mean, yeah, Steve parked in the handicapped spot. He, he drove in the carpool lane and all that, but you know, there were people who could rein him in. I don't think anybody can rein in Elon Musk. Yeah. Why why did you go work for Apple? I know how you got got there. I thought that, that's an interesting story too. Yeah, it it I mean, the first time I went to work for Apple, it was because I had an Apple II and I fell in love with spreadsheet database and word processing and I had a very close friend from college working in the Mac division. And one day he snuck me into Apple and he showed me Mac Paint and Mac Write. And I'm telling you, it was a religious experience because 
the the state of the art back then was you know an Apple tube or and and not long before the state of the art was an IBM Selectric typewriter with a correctable liftoff tape, right? So you thought, oh my God, I can make a mistake typing my term paper and lift off the mistake. And that was the state of the art. And then and then you see Mac Paint and Mac Write and integrated text and graphics, multiple fonts, multiple sizes, WYSIWYG display, WYSIWYG printing, and like, holy shit. I mean, I, you know, I, I went into a different, an entire different expectation of what a computer could do. And I just loved it. Let's talk about thinking backwards from kind of the end result, because there's a lot of companies and there's a lot of agencies that are trying to get ahead of the market. Like, for example, you know, Blockbuster is a perfect example of not thinking forward or kind of what you say. I think, I think you say it's thinking backwards of the end game and trying to get ahead of that. Is that correct? I, I don't want to quote you wrong. Well, I would say, are we talking about Blockbuster, the DVD retailer? Exactly. Blockbuster and yeah. Netflix. Yeah. So I, I would say that my analysis of that is that Blockbuster was thinking forward in the sense that they were saying, well, we are Blockbuster. We have brick and mortar stores. We put DVDs in them. We expect people to drive to our store, pick up the DVD, rent them, take them home, come back, drive back, come back turn in that DVD, get another DVD. And that's what we're good at. We have, you know, 3000 outlets. And so now all we got to do is make sure people are willing to drive to our store and pick up the DVD. Now, if you were thinking backwards from the customer, you would say, so what are customers getting from Blockbuster? They're getting selection. They're getting, they can watch video at their own convenience. You know, what they want is convenience and selection. So right now we can provide convenience and selection through brick and mortar stores in 2000 locations. But imagine if we could provide video to anybody anywhere over the internet. Oh my God, that is so much better. So we should think backwards. I mean, in the same way, Kodak was thinking forward. We're a chemicals company. We put chemicals on print and film. But if Kodak were thinking backwards, they would say, what do our customers get from the chemicals on print and film? They get to preserve memories. Ah, we're in the preserve memories business. Well, a digital sensor would be much better than film and chemicals. So we should make the jump to digital cameras. And the irony of all of this is Kodak invented digital photography, but digital photography killed them. Yeah. How do agencies need to think about, like, where do you see agencies fitting in the successful ones in years to come? Well, I, I think that agencies who are successful, um, they they have to be working backwards. So, you know, what what does a client of an agency want? Well, at some basic level, they want to make sales, right? So, you know, if if you're thinking backwards from your customer, they want to make sales, then your goal is to help them make sales, which is different than saying, well, we have a really great social media team and we know how to produce TikTok videos. We know how to create Instagram reels. We know how to create social media posts. So now we got to find people who want to buy that shit. Well, the better perspective is our customers want sales what do we do to help them get sales? And yes, it may be TikTok, it may be Instagram, but you know who knows what else it's going to be. Maybe it's chatbots. I mean, who knows? Yeah, and they want it faster too. Like I, I always feel that the best agencies are the ones that can solve the biggest problems the fastest. Yeah, and the the best way to do that now is the agencies that are starting to use AI. Oh yeah. And, and integrating that into AI is absolutely total game changer, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's scary in a way. It's not going to replace the agency, but people that use it will replace the people that don't use it. I can promise you that. Absolutely. And you know what? And, and you know, you, you can, not you, but people can cry foul and, you know, like it's, it's going to take away jobs. It's going to ruin creativity. It's going to mean that photographers don't have photo shoots anymore, blah, blah, blah. But 
at a very basic level, listen, that horse is out of the barn and that horse is frolicking free. And if you think you're going to put that horse back in the barn, <laughs> you are badly mistaken. So, the, you know, you got to get out and get out into that 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 field and figure out how to use that horse, not try to get the horse back in the barn. I know that you love top 10 lists and I don't want to go through 10 things. I just want you to, if you had to give people advice for them to be remarkable, what would be the, the two things you would tell them out of your top 10 list? Well, the first thing is counterintuitive, which is, you should not strive to necessarily be remarkable, not in the self-help sense. You know, in, in the self-help book sense, it's like, oh, this book is how to be remarkable. So this is about repositioning, rebranding, how you establish your brand, how you write white papers, how you get on TEDx and, you know, all this stuff so that you can be remarkable. Well, the real way to be remarkable is that you make a difference, that you make impact. And I can pretty much guarantee you that a person like Steve Jobs or Elon Musk or even Jane Goodall, I don't think they spend much time thinking, how do I get people to think I'm remarkable? What they do is they do remarkable stuff. And then guess what? The natural consequence is if you create a Macintosh or if you figure out that chimps have socialized or you change the automotive industry, guess what? You don't have to worry about repositioning yourself as a visionary. People are going to conclude you are a visionary, whether you like it or not. So the way to do this is to make a difference. What's the easiest way, or let me rephrase that because there's not an easy way. <laughs> <laughs> um, how can someone start out to see, because all the people listening, and I think they some most agency owners are accidental. They knew, we knew how to do something cool. Like I, I got my start because my best friend looked like Justin Timberlake. I created a fake band, fake website called in shit and it got popular. And then someone goes, <laughs> can you do a website for me? And I was like, sure, $500. And that's how we got our start. And then we built legal zoom and Hitachi and Porsche and all that kind of stuff. So <laughs> like it's accidental. But that's not accidental. That is market driven. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Well, well, we I guess we I did create a, a remarkable website that was pretty funny. So I guess that that did start. <laughs> but how do people stay on the right track? How did you stay on the right track to keep giving uh, impact okay. to people? Let me be completely transparent about this, all right? So the way, if you perceive that I've stayed on the right track, it's because I was on many tracks and I only publicized the tracks that worked out. <laughs> That's the yeah. truth. Uh, you know, somebody once told me, what's the difference between a good photographer and a bad photographer? And the answer is, the bad photographer doesn't know which pictures to throw away. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say, and that's kind of the, you know, the story of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, listen, the way it works in Silicon Valley is we throw a lot of stuff up against the wall and 1% sticks and we go up to the wall. We paint the bullseye around what's stuck and we say, we hit the bullseye. I mean, you can always hit the bullseye if you paint it on afterwards. Yeah. So I guess just keep throwing stuff at the wall. Yes, right. I mean, I, I think it's the law of big numbers. Now, obviously, although, you know, I got to tell you that, you know, what, one of the good examples of this is venture capital, right? And and you know, people try to explain, you know, well, what do you want in a deal? You know, is it the people? Is it technology? Is the market? And VCs always kind of say all three, but, you know, we, we really um, focus on the people. And I got to tell you that being a venture capitalist for a while, I, I, I completely think it's total BS because I, most of the successful CEOs I know in tech, they are definitely on the spectrum. These are not people that you would necessarily want to hang out with. You wouldn't consider them normal. 
and they wouldn't consider them nice people. They, they, they weren't the high school quarterback. They weren't the, you know, the cheerleader. They weren't the, the beauty queen or the, you know, the king or whatever. I mean, these are the people that were in the back of the room or they were absent or they were, you know, in the principal's office and all that. Um, and, and so if you ask the, if you ask, you know, VC, well, how did you know you should invest in Apple or Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, any of these people? Oh, they say, well, it's my years of experience and my knowledge. And I have just a, I just have a gift for picking out good people. And then you say, well, then why did you invest in Elizabeth Holmes of Terranos? And they said, they'll say, oh, I told my dumbass partners not to invest in Terranos. That was a bullshit company. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, the way it works is that, as Steve Jobs said in his commencement address, you can only connect the dots looking backwards. <laughs> And, yeah. and one thing Silicon Valley is very good at doing is we know how to declare victory and hide defeat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely humbling growing a business and humbling trying to figure things out. Like, I feel like, what, were the, what was the age that you were when you started? Uh, I, I felt like it was maybe around 45 when I was like, I'm starting to figure these things out. <laughs> like, and I haven't even gotten close to figuring stuff out. I, I got like, I feel like it, in my thirties, I was just like kind of wandering around. Like what the hell is yeah. going on? Like, did you go through I, something similar like that too? Yeah. I, I would say if you figured it out at 45, you were early adopter, early achiever, overachiever. Man. <laughs> I think 45 is a little early, actually. Well, I, um, don't get me wrong. I haven't figured everything out. I just feel like I figured out who I am more. I'm 70. I'm just figuring out. I, actually, I think that the older you get, the more you realize what you don't know. Yes. <laughs> Which is very valuable, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Well, guy, this has been amazing. I, I'm honored that you k gave us time to come on the podcast and, and grace us with, with, uh, with your knowledge. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think would benefit the listeners listening in? Well, I mean, I, I, I just, I just hope that people will consider that. Listen, I have this podcast called Remarkable People in which I in interview remarkable people like Jane Goodall and Steve Wozniak. And you know, it, it's now five years old. I have about 5,000 pages of transcripts and 250 hours. And we decided to reduce that down to a 170 page book so we could pass on all this information and inspiration. Because I want to be remembered when I die for having empowered people. And this is one of the main ways I can do it is to empower them with my podcast and my writing. So that's, that's what I'm trying to do with this book. Well, you, you, you've achieved that, uh, but don't, don't be dying anytime soon, but just keep, <laughs> keep going. Uh, uh, I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. All the best to you. Thank you very right. much for having me. Thanks so much, Guy. I hope you enjoyed this content. If you want more content like this, make sure you click on the link on the screen or check out your most popular podcast platform where the full episode is there. And until next time, have a swank day. What are you doing? Go check it out. Click on the link. I'll see you soon.